Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. And welcome you to this evening study. Um, this is a study on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. But we're finishing off this series with, we did a look at um, what happened to E.J. Wagner, and now we're looking at what happened to E.T. Jones. Uh, but before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and the blessings and promises of your word. And we just ask for your presence to be here. We ask that you can work upon our hearts and that this Sabbath will truly be a blessing. We pray for those searching for truth in this world of darkness where there's so many voices clamoring for attention. We ask, Lord, that your spirit, that still small voice, can speak to us and that can draw us out of this darkness into your wonderful light. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> when we had looked at um, E.J. Wagner's, um, we call it his deathbed confession, but, you know, it's a confession of faith of what he believed. He was writing it out for a friend. I'm not sure who he was writing it out for, but um, uh, he's going to describe his reasoning, if we want to call it that, of his positions regarding Adventism, uh, particularly of interest was uh, the idea of the investigative judgment, the 2300 days and so forth, which he had rejected. And <clears throat> the reason why we looked at it, one is it's, it's a question that always comes up, you know, what happened to E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones? Um, but I think for us, it's more lessons uh, that we need to apply to ourselves. So often we we look at these stories in the past, and and we sort of we sort of you know well, I wouldn't have, and, and I've even sometimes just disbelief at his reasoning. But but we have to be really careful because we are human beings, just like E.J. Wagner was. And if we trust in our own thinking. Uh, if we fall into sin and try to justify it in some way, uh, we can end up having the same type of illogical reasons uh, for why we are no longer a Seventh-day Adventist or why we no longer do this or that or why we no longer think this or that is important. And, and we saw this happen within the movement. But again, it's it's more as a warning to us individually. Now, when it comes to A.T. Jones, his his issue is not a theological one. Uh, and and he doesn't reject Adventism. He's uh, with Wagner. Wagner commits adultery. He gets involved in pantheism. I'm not sure which happened first. Um, <clears throat> he ends up, you know, stating that he never really believed a lot of these things, you know, only when he was just brainwashed and. He didn't use that word, he used the words indoctrinated. It's just a you know, fancy word for brainwash. Uh, by the denomination, by his upbringing. Um, but in reality with Wagner, not that I can judge his heart, but it seems that that it's sin that blinds his mind. Um, with A.T. Jones, um, it's going to be a bit different. So one, uh, Jones ends up being very involved in the church in in, in um, <clears throat> the general conference and so forth. Uh, he's over in California for a while. Um, but the issue with him is one more of what I would just call politics. Uh, the politics of the denomination. Uh, Jones got caught up in it. And that's something that we, we can learn from as well. Now, as far as what the truth is of everything that Jones says and what other people say about what Jones did or Jones said, I have no idea. All I know is if if uh, somebody was to write a book about me, uh, depending who it was, uh, they could say a lot of bad things and they could misrepresent all kinds of things that I've been involved in, in the church, 
uh, you know, what I believed about certain things could easily be misrepresented. You know, personal issues, p- politics within the church, within the movement, all of those things could be presented in a way that could create a very a different impression than reality. And, you know, when it comes to to these types of problems, you know, human beings are definitely uh, faulty in a lot of ways. One is our knowledge is only partial. Um, our knowledge of other people is is very hardly any knowledge really about other people. Often we think we know other people that we, you know, we've spent very little time with, you know, but we often don't even know our own hearts. And and even people that we're really close to, we can have quite different impressions of them than other people do. So when it comes to the whole issue of personalities, it's it's something that's really bothered me uh, that happened in the movement is that there's different personalities. People tend to trust their judgment regarding someone. And all of us have uh, some kind of judgment of other people. I'm not necessarily saying condemnation, but a perception about other people's personalities. Because some people I get along with really well. Um, you know, I like a certain type of personality somebody that's open, uh, a bit extroverted, likes talking theology. Um, uh, but there's a lot of people I I wouldn't really get along with. It's not because they're bad or I'm bad particularly. They're just, we have different interests. But when politics starts to get in the way, when issues start to arise, um, people can act very strange. Um, you know, they can side with their friends. They can believe reports that aren't true. They can listen to gossip, right? Um, they sometimes have their own perception of a person that uh, they tend to share with others. And and this is all a very evil, sinful mess that is created when we act in this way. And we all have done it. So we've all been political. We've all had attitudes. We've all it's been wronged in some way by somebody. And we've tried to justify or explain. And um, and I've been through that through my whole life of, of trying to figure out how do I how do I react to misrepresentations to the political uh world. I'm not very good at politics. Uh because I can't be dishonest, so I, I can't be duplicitous. You know, I can't, uh, just can't really do it. I don't know how to, but I mean, I could maybe do it if I didn't have a conscience, but, but I don't know how to disguise, uh, my feelings or thoughts. And because I, well, I just can't, I don't know. Uh, but some people can. So some people can, they can say one thing to your face. Um, but say another thing when you're not there. Um, so, so when we're looking at, hi Kelly, hi Kelly, how are you doing? So we're just uh, we're just starting to read here uh, uh, an appeal for evangelical Christianity by A.T. Jones. And what I'm saying is that uh, his his case is really much more a political one. It's a thing about personalities, gossip, and, and all these types of things. So his is not a theological problem. Jones uh, stayed very orthodox within his thinking, quite differently than Wagner. I guess where you would see that that some of the criticisms criticisms regarding A.T. Jones was his extreme views regarding organization, or at least how organizations should operate. But you know, lots of times when you hear how other people present what somebody believes it isn't always correct it's um, you know it's it's not giving the guy a fair shape so and i and i think with jones this is the case now, jones did run into problems and part of it has to do with his personality now um, i identify with at jones personality a little bit not a good thing 
Um, but I've learned from reading counsels that Ellen White wrote to A.T. Jones, I've tried to learn from those and I've tried to learn from all of her counsels. So, you know, I used to be a bit more of a hothead than I am today. And part of that is just experience and learning to trust that God knows how to take care of things. But I used to be a lot more argumentative than I am now. And probably some people even in, know me at you know, even in a few years, have probably seen some changes. But but Kelly Ross would know a lot more um, about that than any of you since I've known him for over some years. So, yeah. I could uh, comment there, perhaps. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, like Theodore and I, we've been friends since how old were you? Anyway, I always thought you were 14. I, I think I was, first, uh, I was you know, 14. with you guys. So I'd be at least forty. Yeah, I always remember you. Uh, you. You'd get you'd settle into your uh, nest on the couch to listen to your Beatles, and if I dared try to turn down that EP <laughs> stereo, uh, boy, oh boy, you were right off the couch and right in my grill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that's the Theodore I remember. Just passion, you know, and, and very sure of yourself, and and uh, smart. Really used to bug me. <laughs> So I'm smart. You can be, come back smarter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Moving on. Okay. Yeah. But so we all change over time, right? And it, and so when and I was talking about if we read like 1888, 1888 to apostasy by George R. Knight, for instance, and we read about A.T. Jones and his character, you're going to have a very distorted view of what A.T. Jones was like as a person. Some of it might be true stories, but it's only part of the truth, right? You know, because even when I was a kid, I mean, there, I had conflicts with you, Kelly. But, uh, you know, uh, some other people would have seen me quite different because they wouldn't turn down my stereo when I was listening to music. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So, you know, but, uh, and I got along good with all the kids in the neighborhood, except a couple. Actually, uh, I, actually I think this is on topic because, um, Thinking back, why was I asking you to turn your stereo down? And it, and it had to do with my idea of righteousness. Do we know you were listening to that rock and roll music? I'd just become a Christian and I was going to set you straight, man. Yeah. Yeah. So it does have to be a topic. Yeah. and And I hadn't really become a Christian yet, not until I was 17. Yeah, and I was just. Well, uh, you were raised in a Christian home, which was sure an advantage for you. It was good. It's an advantage. Sometimes it's a bit of a disadvantage too for some people. Uh, but it's not yeah. so much as a Christian 50, home. Fifty-fifty is that what you're saying? What's that? Fifty-fifty. Fifty-fifty is that what you're saying? Well, I'm just saying. It could, the, the could go either with it was, Christian home. Yeah, it wasn't so much it was a anyway. Christian home. My mom was a very good Christian. Right. You know, but your dad, but, at least you were able to have Christian discussions, even though he was like way out there, out of the box, in a different box, in another box. <laughs> but he was a lot of fun. The yeah. only man that I ever saw Pastor Watson get irritated with. Yeah. No. <laughs> dad. But you know, the point, the point that we have here is that when it comes to the problems that have happened in the movement, so... With Wagner, we have one problem. That's the problem of sin, trying to disguise itself as righteousness, people going off in doctrinal error, uh, the, the types of reasoning that people use to defend uh, their position. And often it has to do with other things, hurt feelings and all of that. But in, in this case with A.T. Jones, this is more the, the problem that we've seen in the movement regarding politics gossip, organization, how organization acts. You know, he's going to talk about secret meetings, all this type of stuff that was going on. And these types of things happened within our our movement as well. And it, it is one of the most difficult things, I think, for a Seventh-day Adventist. Because, you know, we do believe in organization. We do believe that God has... You know, he doesn't, you know, we're not uh, just whatever we want to do sort of thing. And, you know, um, you know, there's a thing called gospel order. There's a way to do things. 
and you know we need to have an organized work in some way i mean you know it's not every man for himself but but there is a reality uh about how the church acts and and the church doesn't always do the right thing and it didn't in A.T. Jones day uh, they didn't follow the counsels that Ellen White was giving and and that drove Jones a little bit more to the extreme as far as how he looked at organization. And, you know, I, I'm a little bit more that way myself. I, I, I mean, for me, it was really difficult becoming a Seventh-day Adventist from the point of view that, you know, I'm not really trainable, you know, especially when I was younger, I was really independent minded. And so the idea of like submitting to a church or to, to leadership and that type of thing, that really was a cross for me. And I learned a lot, you know, growing up then, you know, like as, as an Adventist, I'm saying growing up in my twenties, because I got baptized, you know, when I was still 19, uh, you know, I found that it was something that I needed to learn to do, to submit to authority. And, and that was something that was really important for my character. Uh, and then to work with others and support others in their vision of what needs to be done, as long as things weren't sinful, right? I mean, lots of times people don't know what they're doing and they have this idea. Um, you know, I was involved in the self-supporting work and I supported the work even when it didn't make sense what they were doing, right? Like I wouldn't have done it that way, but I knew you, you support people, right? You support your pastors, you support your church, even when, you know, it's, it's not what you would do. It's not how you would do it. So I never fought as an Adventist. I never sort of fought for my way, which would have been my natural tendency. And even within the movement, I was treated unfairly. There was lots of rumors and gossips about me. But what I did is I left everything into God's hands. And, and a good example of that would be July 18, 2020, when I was told by Tabo not to present anymore on July 18, 2020. I didn't, you know, I, I stopped promoting it on, on Facebook. Now I did share it at a camp meeting with one guy I was friends with, and that was looked down upon. It's like, well, you can't tell me not to, to talk to my friends and share what I'm studying. I mean, that, that's kind of ridiculous, but, um, <clears throat> but I left it in God's hands and, and I thought, well, if it's truth, you know, the movement will pick it up. And, and that's what ended up happening, right? So I was never pushing it. it wasn't something I pushed on Jeff or pushed on the movement. Uh, Jeff took it up of his own accord. And, and I wasn't involved in all the, those studies that were going from FFA from November 9th uh, to July 18th. You never see me do a presentation at the School of the Prophets. Other than on November 9th, I did two presentations on the 273 for the Mayan calendar. But, you know, they never asked me to present anything. And, and I, did, I, I didn't care, right? It's, it's God's work. Um, so this is something that, that is a lesson that's hard to learn for certain personalities. And for me, uh, I learned a lot from Jones because I think what happened with Jones is and we talked about this when we we're going through the 1893 and 1895 General Conference Bulletin sermons of A.T. Jones, is that he he just took it personally that the message was rejected, and you know he wanted to see Christ returning and to see all of the politics that was happening and to be caught up in it. That is to be a person whose name is slandered and misrepresented, and your actions are not understood, um, he ended up getting defensive. And of course, that just created more and more excuses uh, for people to shut him down. And they finally going to uh, remove his credentials. Now, we see here, this is um, in front of you on the screen, is an appeal for evangelical Christianity. So A.T. Jones presented this on May 27th, 1909. So that's going to be seven years uh, before uh, Wagner's confession of faith. Well, Wagner dies on May 28th, 1916. 
So I thought that was rather interesting, um, just that these are seven years apart. It was found on his death desk after his death, which took place suddenly on May 28th, 1916. So, so this is basically seven years and a day from when Jones presents this to the General Conference uh, to when Wagner passes away. And, and that's the last thing he wrote was this letter. So, <clears throat> so I think that's significant, significant in the context of the 2520 period of seven years. And um, so when I had studied this before, um, like Ellen White is at this general conference in 1909, right? So <clears throat> is that, and I think that's the last general conference session she attends. And I had read something uh, that somebody had put together of, you know, so there's a comment by Kelly, which I'll comment on. Um, <clears throat> so Ellen White is at the general conference session. And somebody put together a statement which they thought was a response to what Jones said at 1909. Uh, but actually, I found that this statement, um, and the statement goes something like, rebellion is in the very air we breathe, or disorganization is in the very air we breathe. And it's actually from nine, uh, 1899. Um, <clears throat> so... I couldn't find anything that Ellen White wrote in response to what was happening to Jones, in response to his disfellowship and so forth. Doesn't mean that it's not there. I just haven't found it. <clears throat> so he's going to present this at uh, the general conference. It's not in the general conference bulletin, so they didn't record it and publish it. He's going to be commenting first about the removal of his credentials. So he starts here, uh, greeting, perfect peace, and at such a time I have appealed and do herein appeal for the procedure, the process, and the action of your executive committee and council assembled at Glan, Switzerland, May 10th to 24th, 1907, and from the decision and action as worded in the communication dated to me June 17th, 1907, and a published officially in the Review and Herald June 27th, 1907. So this was his removal of his credentials. So he's going to go on, and I, and I don't want to read a lot of this. It's very repetitive. But he's saying that basically you need to follow your laws, right? You need to follow your procedures. You, you have, you're, you're organized, and you guys are not following your own rules. That's the first thing that he tries to say. And then he goes back and talks here about, in 1902, I dissented from the action and proposed course of some members of the executive committee of the general conference decide full and perfect right to do. So he's going to talk about things that he disagreed with. And he says, I had a full and perfect right to disagree. Right. So there's some things that he disagreed with. He's not going into detail other than there had to do with the new order of things. So he wasn't happy with the way that they were organizing the work after 1901. Now, in 1901, at the General Conference, Ellen White called for a reorganization of the work. That is, the work had been centered around Battle Creek, and she says um, that it needs to be more decentralized. And, and maybe what Jones is complaining about is it's not decentralized enough. I don't know, because he doesn't go into detail about it. But what, what he's saying is that his views... Uh, tend to be because they weren't in accordance that people are saying, well, we need to know why you're not in agreement. But anyway, let's let's go on and read this part. He says, this, however, was not satisfactory to some who were at the General Conference connection and standing. Therefore, twice I was challenged by these on behalf of the people that I should let the people know where I stand because my general attitude had greatly perplexed many of our people. It is due to you that I give the facts so you can verify this if you wish. So, and everybody hates this. I mean, I've had it happen to me so many times. Well, other people, you know, are complaining about you. Other people need to know this or whatever, right? Instead of just people coming talking to you straight, I want to understand where, you, where you're coming from. So I'm sure he was annoyed by this. So he says, the first of these challenges was not made direct to me. It probably means directly to me. 
If it had been, then in the view of the source from which the challenge came, the people would have known where I stand a year or more before I did tell them. And that challenge came from uh, W.C. White, writing in a way that included his mother in a communication in which the statement was made. And uh, I was mentioned by name to this effect. We do not propose to do anything that will give to, give to you and Elder A.T. Jones influence with the people until the people know where you stand. Um, I repeat, if that had been written direct to me, the people should not should have known just where I stand a year or more before I told it. But I had no disposition to go out of my way to accept a challenge, even by name, and so I said nothing. Now, it's pretty vague here because the question is, what is it that they need to know where he stands? On what point? Now, um, could it be, you know, towards the organization, his attitude towards um, the leadership? Um, I know that there is at this time, there's a controversy dealing with Kellogg and uh, the sanitarium and a bunch of different issues. And so Jones here is is caught up in these basically political issues. Now, um, you know, and if we don't want to have anything that will give you and Jones influence uh, with the people, it doesn't say who the other you is. But this is something that really bothers me. Um, and we can see this problem within uh, the church. You know, Kelly makes a comment about uh, how the movement are treating people the same way the corporate church does towards members that would share or talk about the 2520 overreaching control. Um, yeah, let me see this. Uh, control even into our homes. And then the statement from the spirit of prophecy. When persons in our midst who are moved by the spirit of God, through whom the great treasures of his word are unfolded to us, increasing in every phase, let us not take the position that we know all that is worth knowing and what we do not know is not worth knowing, hindering the very ones who are digging for truth. As for hidden treasure, the word of God is opening more and more uh, to us. Just as long as we live on the earth, we shall be able to find a whole treasure house of beautiful uh, things. Some uh, some will see beauty in one truth, some in another, some will look at it in another way, and we're not all constituted alike. But some think that they ha- that what they have is all there is to acquire. They say of others, do not let them come into our meetings. We do not want them here. We do not believe as we do. I wish to say hands off, let God work through human instrumentalities according to his will. And um, yeah, so the hands off part Kelly focuses on there. And and I think this is important, you know, just because somebody is is presenting something that well, is not how I would present it. Maybe I'm not even sure that they fully understand what they're saying. You can't constantly be protecting people from the views of others. If people are going to grow, they're going to have to themselves study and decide if what somebody's saying is true or not. Uh, Otherwise, you just end up with a very intellectually weak congregation if they're always being protected, if they're always being fed milk and they're never, they're never able to, to stand on their own. And and there is a way to allow discussion to happen that is not destructive. It is actually constructive. If, if somebody's teaching error, my approach is not to, to address the error, but to address the person, to work with the person, because sometimes the error is not really the issue. It's other things happening with the person which is why the error um, is being presented or clung to or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes, you know, people, they've had hurt feelings. There's all kinds of things going on. And and so they take some theological stance. And what we do is we argue with them. You know, you're wrong. Well, it's not very redemptive. And, you know, we shut them down. Uh, we do a lot of damage, and so, and and we create we create problems in this way. Now, you know, and I'm not 
you know, my perspective of what happened at the School of the Prophets is, is my perspective. Could be right, could be wrong. But the one thing that I saw when I was there the last time is that all of the problems that existed were actually caused by the, the leadership at the School of the Prophets and not caused by the students. But the students were always blamed for these problems. And these problems could have been easily resolved by just simple communication. And instead, they would have these long meetings and then they would bring people in and, and lay down the law of what they were supposed to do, even though the person, you know, everything that they were responding to was just imaginary. At least in my experience, that was what was happening. And so, so they just created more and more problems. And, and this is something that was so easy to deal with that anybody who had any experience in dealing with, with an institution would not have had the problems that they had when we were there in 2018. And even before that, people who left, uh, they had problems with, um, those problems were easily resolvable. But instead, they were actually almost totally created by the way things were done at the School of Prophets. And it was, there's just a way to deal with people that was not understood uh, in Arkansas. To deal with, that. You, you can actually just create problems out of thin air uh, if you treat people unjustly. If you have secret meetings, if you misrepresent what they're what they're saying, you never listen to anything that they say, you never consider them, you never listen to their feelings, everything that they do is wrong. Well, you're going to find that you're going to create the very thing that you say you're trying to stop. Now, and this is something I learned uh, sort of the hard way, because um, I tend to trust people a lot, but I, I learned. That when somebody says one thing, but the results are always something else, those something else results are actually what they are wanting. That is, their words don't really describe what their goals are, what they want to see. And because they keep getting the same results, uh, that's what they want. And some people, they'll say words of peace, but they want conflict. And they create conflict everywhere they go. And yet, you know, I used to believe, well, they obviously don't want to have conflict. They all say they don't want to have conflict, but they're constantly having conflict. You know, it's unfortunate, right? But I, I came to realize it's actually what they wanted. I, I don't know if people had that, have had that experience or have seen that, that idea. So when we look at this situation in with A.T. Jones, we don't know what the truth is. Right. That's all I'm trying to say here. We don't know if what A.T. Jones is saying is representing things correctly. Or it's his distorted perception of what was happening. I, I would think that generally the truth lies somewhere in between what some people would have said about what Jones was doing and what Jones himself said he was doing. I don't know. I can't judge Jones as a person. But what we can look at is see the kind of problems that were existing. So he says this, this first call was this challenge made to him. And he says the second call upon me in behalf of the people's knowing just where I stood uh, because of the perplexity of the people regarding my general attitude came from a president of the general conference. And I answered it in the leaflet, some history, some experience and some facts in March of 1906. Uh, the statement of the people of where I stand did not satisfy the members of the General Conference Committee. And that committee as such took it up and issued a statement in the latter part of May of 1906, in which they called upon me for proofs of what I had written and demanded to know how I knew and what I had told in the leaflet, Final Word and Confession, in July 1906. I gave the proof and told just how I knew. Okay. <clears throat> So, so he has a confession as well, and we're going to look at that. So, but before we look at that, we're going to look at some history and some experience and some facts. So this is what he's referring to from 1906. 
Um, so this has to do, it says, at the regular monthly meeting of the Sanitarium family in the Sanitarium Chapel, Battle Creek, Michigan, Sunday, March 4th, 1906, 8 p.m. Okay, I can safely appeal to the whole Sanitarium family to witness that since I came here two years ago last November, I have not at that time in any meeting or in any class discussed or dwelt upon the controversy that has been carried on from the general conference sources. My address in the tabernacle the night of January 2nd is the first time that I have spoken on the subject. All all who are here now, who were here when I came, will remember that when I came, I said to the whole family that we here should have nothing to do with that matter, that we have work to do, and that we could not afford to abandon or neglect that work, to engage in controversy of any kind that we could spend our time far better in studying the Bible and sticking close to the work that God has given us to do. And we could in discussing differences or in defending ourselves against attack or even in trying to correct false reports. And that sounds obviously very good, right? And it is one of the things that I've learned is that when there are false reports, the best thing to do is leave them alone. I mean, you might try with an individual just explaining yourself, but when there are people who are working against you, they have a per, uh, particular view, there's not going to be anything that you're going to do to change their minds. The people who are spreading the false reports have a reason that they're doing so. So it's something that, you know, we have to always be aware of. And I, I find that the best thing to do is to leave them aside you know, people are misrepresenting what you're doing. There's nothing you can do about it. Just nothing except to trust in God. Now, I, and I think that Jones, as time went on, even though he's giving this good advice, I don't think he always followed it. All of that is true yet, except that now the time has come when we cannot be true to the truth and continue completely silent on these matters. And I don't know if I agree with him. I think if Jones had stayed completely silent, and let let the let it in God's hands, he would have been better off. But I wasn't there. Yeah, a wise man once said nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's not usually me. Anyway, tonight I wish to state the case as it is so far and why it is that I must speak. The greater part of all of, of what I said shall to you tonight. Uh, the greater part of what I shall say to you tonight has been already said to General Conference Brethren, not to all of the, the General Conference brethren, but to Brother Daniels and some others. Nowhere in it is there or will there be any purpose to attack anybody, nor any attempt to discredit anyone or to put anyone in the wrong. I have some facts of history to state and some facts of experience. I make no objection to anyone's doing or having done any of the things to which I do not agree. My sole purpose is to tell why I cannot do so, also, I should say that so far as I'm concerned and as to anything that shall be said tonight, there's no question at all and no issue at all as to the testimonies as such. <clears throat> uh, what I shall say further tonight will be introduced by a short statement that I read last Tuesday morning to such of the General Conference brethren as were then in town. When I learned last Friday that Brother Daniels was to be in town over Sabbath, I sent to him a note asking to meet him and the other general conference brethren who might be here. When it came about on Tuesday morning, there were only three present. If there had been only one, it would have been all the same. Or if there had been the whole general conference committee, it would have all been the same. As all that I wished to do was to state a few facts and to tell them what we now find ourselves obliged to do. What I had to say, I wrote down and read to them so as to avoid misunderstanding and so, misre and so misreport of what I said. I read it now to you. I read it now to you because that in it, there is something that very vitally concerns this family and especially a few who have been in the family. Possibly there may be a few here yet to whom it is especially, it especially applies. The great majority of the family it does not touch particularly, I'm glad to say. I read, the sanitary management has not objected to anybody's going away. Now, and, and I don't fully understand this. Um, so maybe somebody else has more insight into it, uh, what this issue is. But uh, we're going to read it and see if we can make sense out of it. Before this late campaign began in Battle Creek in December last, we told the whole family that every one of them was at perfect liberty to go wherever he should choose to go. 
that wherever the Lord wanted them, there they should be. Indeed, does not everybody know that the whole purpose and work of the sanitarium has been to educate and train people for the express purpose of their going away? The sanitarium has had, therefore, no difficulty at all with respect to any of the workers going away. The only difficulty that there has been is with the secret, underhanded, treacherous, and dishonorable course and conduct of those who, while insisting that they cannot stay, that the Lord has shown them that they should go and that they must go, yet do stay and will not go, and we cannot get them to go. <laughs> so I, I'm not really sure. Um, the only thing I can say in, in respect to this, because I, I was at Silver Hills Sanitarium uh, when I was in my early 20s uh, for two years. And and I remember I, I got a call to come to Alberta to go to Warburg to help with Ron Valent with the institution that they were going to, you know, do a sanitarium here, you know, in, in Alberta. And um, uh, initially, you know, when I got this call, the guy I worked with, Leroy Proctor, he was like, okay, this sounds good, you know. And uh, uh, he actually uh, drove down with me. He drove, we drove to Warburg. We visited for a little bit. He met some of the people here. And uh, the guy who donated the land, Elmer Knopp, and and, and, and then uh, when we went back, um, Phil Brewer, who who ran the guest house part of the sanitarium, uh, I guess they had a meeting and they decided I shouldn't go. You know that that I needed to be there for three years before I went anywhere, before I got a commission. I didn't even know they gave commissions, and I didn't know really what that was. And I when I went there, they never said anything about three years. I didn't know how long I was going to be there, all these types of things. Uh, but I felt called to come here. And and so this kind of reminds me of that, that sometimes people decide for you what you should do. And I'm not really a fan of that. Obviously, if somebody can give me counsel and I can weigh it out and bring it to God and decide what I'm to do. But sometimes there are people who decide, I think this would be best for you. And so we're not going to support you if you do this other thing. And not with any real reason, right? You know, there was no danger that, that was awaiting me. I, I didn't see what another year was going to do as far as me learning anything. You know, a, that didn't really make any sense. There was not, not any good reason that I could see why I needed to stay. But, but anyway, I, I did end up going. I didn't end up staying and I was still treated nice by them. It's just uh, they they try to use their efforts to get me to stay for some reason. But anyway, so we can see that these types of things happen. People try to make decisions for others. But also we see here in this case that some of these people obviously aren't. They say that they they, they can they that they can not stay and yet they don't leave. So I'm not sure exactly what's going on here. Uh, he says they insist that they must go and send in their resignation to take effect a month or six weeks or two months or more afterward or to take effect when their contract expires anyhow. And we accept the resignation to take effect earlier or possibly immediately. And then they insist that if they go earlier, they must be paid full wages clear up to the expiration of the time of their contract or they ask to stay two weeks more. And when we consent to their plea, then they spend their time just as far as they can and make opportunity day and night to create dis dissatisfaction in others of the family and even in their pa in the patients to attend secret meetings off the premises or to hold secret meetings on the premises to show disrespect to their teachers to those in responsibility in fact to everybody who does not fall in with their own spirit uh, to despise the bible prayer and meetings whether for religious service or for the benefit and the improvement of the sanitarium and its work uh, to be careless, if not reckless, of the property of the sanitarium, to portray confidence, in short, to do any unchristian thing and no Christian thing if they can help it. And when at last their own set time expires or because of their perverse course, we are compelled to discharge them, then they claim and report that they are turned out because they believe the testimonies and still hang around the place, watching for chances to poison the minds of others and to make great representations of how the testimonies tell everybody to get out of Battle Creek. Now, so this gives us a bit more context. 
Now, this type of thing happened at the School of the Prophets. So there would be people that uh, were there, that they'd have problems with. Now, sometimes the problems were created because of the staff. Sometimes the people themselves had problems. <coughs> and I don't know the situation here that Joan's talking about, but I would think, you know, there's always a little bit of mixture of things. Obviously, the people say, you know, Ellen White says to get out of Battle Creek. And so so you've got people who are disruptive. And everywhere you have people, you're going to have problems. Uh, the question is, how do you address those problems? <coughs> anyway, let's go on. In short and in perfect truth, the spirit manifested in the course followed is exactly such as that of the trade unions in their arrogance, their boycott, their strike, their picketing. Through it all, there has been no sign of James 3, verse 17 and 18 on the part of the ones most devoted to your cause. <coughs> on the contrary, the spirit manifested has been the open manifestations of James 3, verse 14 to 16. And I'm just going to look at those verses. So James 3. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, and peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. <clears throat> so, you know, one thing I know is that it's a very difficult situation because a person may have a good spirit, but they can be misrepresented. And, um, you know, so there's, it's not, it's not always clear cut when it comes to judging other people's actions. And he says, and sorry as we all are that it is so, it is the plain silver truth that you brethren have sanctioned. It. You have promoted it. You have fired it and kept it alive. You've set the example of holding the secret meetings. Now, this is something that I have personal feelings about, uh, the idea of secret meetings. Now, all this time we have kept silent on this subject. We have made no opposition to what you have been doing. We have let you and all these others go straight along, except only in accepting uh, the resignations and refusing longer to endure the imposition of those who simply could not stay and must and just must go, and yet simply would not go. But now... When this mischievous working is persistently carried on in the very rooms of our buildings, even so late as nine o'clock at night, and since this working has reached the point where it is a constant and open violation of the civil law, we are now compelled in the interests of plain everyday civility to say nothing of common morality, that we will not be, we, that we be not guilty of countenancing and becoming parties to open lawlessness. We're compelled to take an open stand against it and speak out plainly on it. We shall be unfaithful to both human and divine trust longer to be silent and inactive with this thing going on. Now, again, you know, we don't know a lot of the details. This is kind of vague. Yeah. So, you know, Jeff here say that we don't we just don't understand the dynamics of a person's thoughts and their situation. And, and this is where I think that Jones, whether, you know, what he's saying is true his perception is correct or not. And, you know, obviously I don't like secret meetings. I, I don't, I, I think, you know, everything should be as open as the day. It's, he's actually going to quote that later from Spirit of Prophecy. He says, but please never think for a moment that we are going to meet it by any such working as that which has been promoted, secret meetings or secrecy of any kind. We are going to meet it openly only the plain statement of the truth as it is in the Bible and with the quiet entreaty of Christians. Since you are especially interested in the testimonies, I quote from a testimony, an excellent statement of the principle on which we shall work. In this sentence, whatever is not as open as the day is of the methods of Satan. You know, one of the problems I've had with Adventism is nominating committees and board meetings and... Uh, things where stuff is discussed, people are discussed, but the person is never there uh, to hear what's being said about them. Because if the person was there, many of those things wouldn't be said about that person. 
right? And and I'm guilty of this myself in the nominating committee, something that I'm ashamed of, is that I spoke about a person in a negative way in a, in a nominating committee and the person wasn't there and it then turned around and happened to me and uh, I, I learned my lesson uh, and it's one of the reasons why I have this problem because it's such a temptation you have a secret meeting nothing's supposed to be you know go out from that meeting and the way the Warburg Church used to work is there was no secret meetings if there was a, a board meeting Every board member would go and tell everybody what happened at the board meeting, and then they would get a feedback. And if there was complaints, the next board meeting, they would say, well, so-and-so didn't really like, you know, they had this input and in what the decision we made. And so, really, the whole church always made every decision. Everybody had a voice. Everybody was heard. And um, It's kind but, of rare nowadays. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they changed it. You know, the people came in who, uh, once we got pastors, we used to never have pastors in our uh, board meetings or in our nominating committee uh, when I first went to Warburg. Uh, later on, we got pastors who decided that they needed to control what was happening. So, yeah, it's 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 just a, something I just have, have a hard time with. You know, and, and if I'm, and I'm not going to hide something from somebody, right? So, you know, if I, if I have a problem with the person, I, I want to go to that person first and, and figure out, you know, if the, if the problem is actually with me, you know, maybe there's something I don't understand. But, you know, I know I haven't been perfect in that. But we've all failed in that area. I can include you guys in that too, I'm pretty sure. Upon this principle, we have begun our course of action by coming thus, first of all, to you personally and telling you plainly of it. We have not mentioned this to any others. We have now told you and now are perfectly free to say to any or all of the others what may be considered proper and to pursue, pursue the only course that is open to us and to do the things which we must do to be faithful to men and God. Um, with our cooperation, as before stated, uh, and your liberal offers of money, you've got some to leave the sanitarium who might not otherwise have gone. I mean, in this way, you may get some more to go. But my dear brethren, in the spirit of those who insist that they must go, and yet will not go if they can avoid it, we pity you and any others who may be so fortunate as to fall into their hands. We shall sincerely pray for them that they may be converted and find and manifest the true spirit of James 3, verse 17 and 18, so that you shall not have to endure the like wrongdoing that you have helped these to inflict upon us. Now, I just want to address, you know, what happened when Heidi and I were kicked out of FFA or the School of the Prophets back in uh, early 2019. So, you know, many people know the story. We were invited there by Jeff to help a friend who had cancer, um, but they also wanted us to, to stay at the school. And, um, and for me to do some teaching, which I did. And, um, it was, is a very profitable time there, but we were always uncertain about what, what our role was. And we were, we were sort of overworked and overworked doing things that didn't make sense. Cleaning lots and lots of cleaning of things that weren't dirty. And, you know, we didn't really grumble about it, but, uh, I made some suggestions about it, just, you know, that maybe instead of having people doing different jobs every time, that just give a job that a person's suited to and they can can do continue to do that same job for a while. Because often we have these problems where somebody didn't do their job and then you would come in and have to do this job. And then, and sometimes you'd get blamed for, for not doing something that you did. And it was just all confusion. It didn't really make any sense. Plus, the place wasn't really very dirty. Um, there's some jobs that needed to be done, but some that didn't. So it, it, it just seemed like it was a make-work project. It was like, you know, in Russia, the Soviet Union, where they had, you know, really clean str streets because they had old ladies out there with brooms sweeping the streets instead of just having a street sweeper, you know, type of thing. So... It didn't really make sense. It wasn't profitable work. But 
Uh, anyway, what happened is, and we, and we still never really understood it, but just rumors went around about people's attitudes. And I'm not sure where they came from. Sometimes it would, you, you say something to somebody and then it would be reported back to Bronwyn in some distorted manner. But instead of Bronwyn coming to me and saying, you know, did you say such and such? They would have a meeting and decide, you know, that we must have said such and such or done such and such. And then they would lay down the law without us allowing us to even make an explanation. And so they just kept imagining all kinds of things that we were doing or thinking or or attitudes that we didn't have. So when they kicked us out, it wasn't about anything that we'd actually done. It was about what they imagined we had done. And so it was it was kind of strange. And, and we were trying to do everything we could to please them. So there wasn't anything that we were, you know, we weren't complaining. We weren't trying to, you know, create problems, but they believe that we are creating all of these problems. So it was, it was, it was very strange. Um, and we just were puzzled by it. You know, it was like, you know, like we'd ask questions like, well, what is it? What is it that we could do that would be productive that would make you guys happy? And, and it's like the rules just kept changing all the time. So, so I'm not sure why, you know, I still don't really know the answer, but, but those types of things happen. <clears throat> so people are imperfect. They don't all communicate. They don't all see the world the same way. What to one person is a, a little moment to another person is a weight grievous to be born. And, and since we're not all the same, uh, those things have to be taken into account. So, uh, well, yeah, follow orders, whether it was military or not, I don't know. It's just, it's not how, in my experience in the self-supporting work, it just didn't seem to me that uh, the leadership at the School of the Prophets had the slightest idea of how to deal with people. They looked at people as problems, in and and they were always trying to solve these problems, but the problems didn't really exist. As far as I could see, they were just created. But they believed other people were creating the problems, not them. But that's just my view. I could be wrong. Anyway, so Jones goes on. And then now as we take an active and positive course, instead of any longer the passive and negative, please do not think that there will be any new or strange position taken or any new or strange thing taught. And this I have an advantage that can never be taken away from me. I mean, in my books, tracts, and articles, that are all published by the denomination with the denominational imprint and endorsement, even up to date, the two republics, the empire series, the great nations of the day, today, place of the Bible in education, the consecrated way, the federation of churches, articles in the signs up to the last week. In these books and articles, there is every main feature of the third angel's message. Um, just as I, um, just as I am and shall still, shall be still teaching it. You may repudiate me, you may repudiate my books and articles, but there's one thing certain, and that it is certainly as you and the denomination preach the third angel's message, you will preach the things that are in those books and articles, just as in principles and in facts, those books and articles stand today. I do not mean that anyone will have to use those books and articles or even to quote from them, but that they will have to preach the truths that are in those books and articles or even to there, it, there is where I stand and where I shall continue to stand as to that. Therefore, it is perfectly plain that there can never be any division or what some call a split in the denomination so far as I and the truths of the third angel's message are concerned. And if a division is made over me, it will have to be solely because I am the friend of sinners. So what we can see here, I guess, is what they wanted to know from him was his position, where he stood. And he says, well, I stand on what I've written, which is published by the denomination. So I'm not really sure what what was going on here. All I can see is that there's a lot of politics, a lot of personalities. Uh, the brethren demurred to the phrase secret meetings, claiming that they had not held any secret meetings. But it all turns upon technical meaning of the word secret. Therefore, I will state what I mean by the phrase. When the General Conference Brethren came to me this town first in December, I myself personally invited Brother Daniels to come into this chapel and spend the time of the midday meeting in whatever way he pleased, every day while he was here, as long as he might stay. 
And he came in one day, that was all. He said that he had testimonies to read and he could not read a testimony in 15 minutes. But I said, there are 25 minutes that you could have every day and you could take possession and dispense with the singing and the opening service. And 25 minutes every day for all the time you stayed would have given you ample time to read all the testimonies that you had. In addition to that, we asked the brethren themselves, I and other brethren of the board and management, asked the general conference brethren to come into the sanitarium and go through every department of it, to go into the medical classes and see what the doctors were teaching, to go into the nurses' classes and do the teaching themselves, and find out anything that they possibly could that is wrong, and to show it to us and help us to put it away. But they did not and would not do anything of the kind. Instead of that, they held meetings with the medical students and with the helpers outside of the institution, without informing the faculty or the management, and with the understanding on one occasion at least that if I or Dr. Stewart came, the meeting could not be held. And at other times, the presence of others was refused. Now, that is what I refer to as secret meetings, and a good many such were held. So some of us can think of situations like this. You know, situations where, you know, for instance, and so I'm just going to use my experience at the School of the Prophets. One of the things I think that's important in a self-supporting institution, like a school, is that that people work together. That means if you're if you're a leader, you need to spend time in the gardens with the students, right? You need to be spending time with the people that are there. You need to get to know them in working with them, and not in like bossing people around. So when we were there back in 2016 with um, Tyler and um, Brittany and Michael, who were running the school, I mean, they're running the work. We worked side by side with them and they were always appreciative of everything we did. Uh, When we were there in 2018, we were given things to do and often worked by ourselves and did not work alongside the leadership. And and I think that was a mistake because it allowed for, if they had worked with us, they would have a completely different relationship with the, with the students. And and it was always unclear, like, who was students and who wasn't, because some people were and some weren't. It was, it was very confusing. We wanted cl- clarity on what really was happening, what our responsibilities were. It was not very clearly communicated. But but the other thing that's happened in this movement, too, is when we have meetings, so we'd have like a camp meeting. If I was speaking, there were certain people like Tabo who would not listen to any of my presentations. He would either not be there or if he was there, he would be way in the back talking to somebody or doing something else instead of of listening to the presentations. And that's always a mistake, right? And you can see why that is. One is you need to know what people are saying. And and often what people will do is they may not be there, but they will ask somebody else, what did he teach? What did he say? And, And of course, if somebody says, well, he was teaching this or he said this out of a whole bunch of presentations that you did, something that they didn't like, and that's all that you that person heard heard is what this other person didn't like without even hearing anything else. Uh, that's going to create lots of bias. So you're going to think that that person is teaching error because somebody says, well, he said such and such a thing. And it, maybe the person did say it. Maybe they didn't. Right. But that's all that person is going to know. So <clears throat> those types of things are important that you work together. That you spend the time. And so what Jones is talking about is the leadership. They're not even really interested in seeing what's going on. They've already prejudged the situation. And all they want to do is create uh, dissent or to solve the problems that they imagine exist. So now, um, yeah, yeah, worldly people know much better how to run things because one is they have to make money. Um <laughs> You, they, those businesses don't survive that don't know how to deal with people. I know like uh, my son, Micah, owned a landscaping business. 
And I've talked to a lot of people who worked for him. And they said he was the best boss they ever had. Because one is he was right there. Um, he worked with people. He treated people really well. And, and the reason he did is he likes making money. <laughs> you know, he, he knew that if, if, he's, if he wants to get things done, he has to encourage people. He has to have ha happy workers, people that are willing to go, uh, you know, to do extra work and to work hard just for him. And uh, I think even more so, even more so in the church. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, cool. <laughs> one of the things I said to a pastor one time that, and that, you know, I said, you have to recognize that the church is a voluntary organization. Like if you treat, if you don't listen to what people have to say, they're not going to support what you, the decision that the board makes. Just because you pass something through a board uh, doesn't mean anything because you have to have the support, whole support of the church. And, and he just liked to push things through the board. He thought, well, it takes too much work, you know, to find consensus, right? You know, he just believed, you know, you got a majority voted on something, then that's it. Everybody should just support it. It's a, it's a voluntary organization. They're not going to support it if they don't feel that they're hurt. And if you just allow them to feel that they're hurt, even if it's not the decision that they would make, but at least if they felt that they were heard, people are much more likely to support something. It's a pretty simple principle, but often ignored. And, and obviously in a church, you can kind of get away with it to some degree because, you know, bad people just leave or they just become disinterested. You know, it doesn't matter. There's, you know, anyway, yeah, pastors have career plans. Yeah. Okay. I should say a word further with reference to that, which has been done as being in a violation of the civil law. Both the state and the United States government have found it necessary to enact laws for the protection of people and their institutions in their rights of property and liberty of action. These laws are right and good and are truly civil laws in every respect. And that which has been done in, via, in connection, in the connection of which I am speaking has been to open, in open violation of these six strictly civil laws. It is the duty of every person to be respectful to the civil law and every Christian, every Christian is so. Indeed, no Christian can ever in the performance of any Christian duty violate any truly civil law. For every Christian is commanded by Christ to render to Caesar the things which are Caesar's, as well as to God the things that are God's. And Christ never contradicts himself by leading any of his people to deny to Caesar that which is Caesar's, while rendering to God the things that are God's. And whenever those who profess to be Christians allow their zeal for what they suppose to be the things of God, to lead them to the point of violating the civil law, and thus denying, deny to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, they simply blunder and do in fact deny to God that which is God's. They put themselves outside of that which is God's, and in violating the civil law, they put themselves on a level with other criminals and are responsible to the civil jurisdiction without any ground of appeal to God. And to the point of open and constant violation of true and right civil law, this campaign against the sanitarium and the medical school has been carried. And in this, it has been carried to the point where we cannot any longer keep silent and be true to our obligations as Christians. Now, what I think is happening here, um, if I remember this history, is that there was a battle over Battle Creek Sanitarium, this aptly named uh, uh, sanitarium, about control. And Kellogg's a part of this. So I'm not sure exactly what particular things are going on, but anyway, this is this is where Jones ends up. He he gets he he gets confronted with all of this politics, and I think this is partly what drives into some of his views regarding organization, right? So I don't really want to read everything that's here in this this document, but um, we're gonna stop here. <clears throat> And hopefully this is interesting to people, uh, what, what we've been reading. But uh, anyway, any, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. This is kind of yeah. Th this kind of a, kind of a bombshell, but I'll drop it. Uh, just mention mention me in your prayer. Uh, got a Gleason score of seven on the prostate cancer, so 
Next steps are bone scan and CT scan. Okay. Okay, so you got some health issues you have to you need prayers about. Yeah. Yeah. I was just waiting my turn. There's so much of it in family. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, well, we'll pray. My dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath. And we thank you for the people who study and seek your uh, character. We know, Lord, we are all faulty and we have all made state mistakes in, in dealing with others. And we haven't always seen how to redeem others who are in error, especially when their personalities uh, conflict with ours or our plans, our view of the world. And so we just pray that we can learn as we continue in these studies about righteousness by faith, how, how they should be acted out. That it's not just the theory, but it's a practice. And I pray for Kelly that you can help him in his health concerns. Uh, we know, Lord, that um, he's had a rough life. And, um, and we just pray that your healing hand can be upon him and um, that uh, he can be strengthened in his faith and trust in you and that you can use him to your glory. And we pray for each of us, Lord, that you can help us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.